Welcome to the Rare Books Department at the J. Willard Marriott Library at the University of Utah. The Rare Books Department is one of five departments within the Special Collections Division. Other departments include manuscripts, photo archives, audiovisual, and print and journal. Special Collections materials are held on the fourth floor of the Marriott Library and can be accessed by request in the Special Collections Reading and Reference Room. The Rare Books Department holds more than 80,000 items, including books, maps, ephemera, and realia, documenting the record of human communication, from Sumerian clay tablets to 21st century artist books. By actively collecting and digitizing material of historic and aesthetic importance, the Rare Books Department preserves a heritage of thought, artistic endeavor, and innovation that inspires the human spirit today. We provide reference, research, and educational access to local, regional, and international communities, strengthening the ability of faculty to teach, students to learn, and communities to find common denominators. The philosophy behind the Rare Books Department has long emphasized the importance of the book as a physical object. Some of the most meaningful interactions with our collections have occurred in the classroom, where students are able to hold history in their hands. What does it mean to be radical? Well, it depends on who you ask. In order to define the term radical, we can look at its Latin derivation, radix, meaning root. We can follow its origins to the radical reforms which developed in Europe during the 18th and 19th centuries. Or we can debate whether one political party is more radical than the other. But when it comes down to it, to be radical is to fight against the status quo. And the only way to do that is to fundamentally change whatever system is in place, to get to the root of the problems. The radical voices of the 20th century were a convergence of writers, activists, and artists closely linked to the labor and socialist movements that were forming within the United States and all over the globe. Over the course of several decades, such social movements emerged in different areas around the country, and particularly through the work of independent, underground or alternative presses which publish their radical ideas in the form of pamphlets, posters, and literary magazines. Although unassuming in form, these materials created a cultural impact and develop intricate networks which continue to highlight issues of civil rights, censorship, and free speech today. This literature of politics is multifaceted, filled with various genres that range from poetry to pamphlet, novels to newscasts, Today, new methods of disseminating literature allow voices from all walks of life to be heard on major digital platforms. However, a century ago, these virtual megaphones were non-existent, and if you wanted a voice, you had to make it from scratch. The Industrial Revolution, a period spanning the course of nearly 100 years, saw the rise of machines, the middle class, and the urban population. From it, increased opportunities for employment can be found in factories, mills, and mines. The development of such jobs required an evolving organization of laborers, beyond what previous trade unions could offer. A union that could represent skilled and unskilled workers, workers from all trades and backgrounds, and workers from all over the world. On June 24, 1905, a convention of some 200 socialists, anarchists, and radical trade unionists came together to form the Industrial Workers of the World. The IWW, often called the Wobblies, promoted one big union, a concept that cut across traditional guild and union lines to unite and organize workers as one social class against a capitalist industry. The notion of industrial unionism, as opposed to craft unionism, also pushed other aspects of social justice, such as being the first American union to welcome women, Black Americans and immigrants, not only into the organization, but into prominent roles of leadership. Its inclusion of diverse workers, trades, and industries helped the IWW grow in popularity. At its peak in 1917, it celebrated more than 150,000 members, with active charters all throughout the United States, Canada, and Australia. By the 1920s, however, several factors caused membership to decline dramatically. Other labor groups saw the Wadleys as too radical. 
and the same sentiment was also echoed by the government, which began to crack down on a growing number of socialist groups during the first Red Scare after World War I. Throughout the 20th century, the industrial workers of the world were met with unparalleled resistance from federal, state, and local governments in America. Beyond mere suppression of the First Amendment, many of its members and affiliates were imprisoned on the basis of legislative acts passed by Congress, such as the Espionage Act, the Sedition Act, the Smith Act, and the McCarran Act. Since the founding of the industrial workers of the world in 1905, Songs have played an important role in spreading the message of one big union. Such songs have been preserved in editions of the Little Red Songbook, or Songs of the Industrial Workers of the World. This compilation of tunes, hymns, and songs were meant to help build morale and promote solidarity among the IWW members. Between 1909 and 1995, 36 different editions were published. The eighth edition, published in 1914, commemorates IWW songwriter Joe Hill, who was arrested that same year for an alleged murder. Joe Hill was a Swedish-born labor activist, songwriter, and member of the Industrial Workers of the World. Hill rose to prominence in the organization, traveling across the country while making speeches and writing political songs and satirical poems. His songs were often parodies of Christian hymns written for union members to sing along to. In 1914, while Hill was working at the Silver King Mine in Park City, Utah, he was convicted of the murder of John G. Morrison and his son. Morrison was a former policeman and a local grocer in Salt Lake City, and was well known in the area. Following political debates and international calls for clemency, Hill was unable to appeal his case and sentenced to execution by firing squad. On November 19, 1915, Joe Hill was executed at Utah's Sugar House Prison. His final will, which was eventually set to music by Ethel Rehm, reads, My will is easy to decide, for there is nothing to divide. My kin don't need to fuss and moan. Moss does not cling to rolling stone. My body? Oh, I could choose. I would to ashes it reduce. And let the merry breezes blow, my dust to where some flowers grow. Perhaps some fading flower then would come to life and bloom again. This is my last and final will. Good luck to all of you, Joe Hill. The Rebel Girl is a song written by Joe Hill that was published as sheet music by the Industrial Workers of the World in 1915 for their Little Red Songbook. It is said that the song was inspired by and written for IWW activist Elizabeth Gurley Flynn. Following the execution of Joe Hill, other labor organizers and social activists with similar goals continue to face public and legal scrutiny, not only for their actions, but for their words as well. The Espionage Act of 1917 was passed shortly after the United States entered into World War I. The federal law made it a crime to interfere in any way with the war effort, including disrupting military recruitment or aiding other nations at war with the U.S. The law had unexpected consequences with regards to the First Amendment, and many in opposition of the Espionage Act saw it as a government attempt to suppress and punish what was deemed to be unpopular speech. The Act also gave the Postmaster General authority to confiscate and refuse mail publications that he deemed to be in violation of the prohibitions. Less than a year later, the law was extended and a set of amendments generally called the Sedition Act of 1918 called for greater punishments and wider prohibitions. The Sedition Act prohibited many forms of speech, including any disloyal, profane, scurrilous, or abusive language about the form of government of the United States, or the flag of the United States, or the uniform of the Army or Navy. In the fall of 1918, Max Eastman faced a jury in a Manhattan courtroom with the mission of defending himself and fellow contributors to his literary journal, The Masses, against indictment under the Espionage Act. Because The Masses was anti-war, it had been shut down by the United States government. It was deemed offensive and contrary to mailing regulations during World War I. Eastman's speech stunned the courtroom, and with eight dissenting votes, no verdict was reached. Quickly, a pamphlet version of the speech was printed and circulated around the country, 
under the moniker of Eastman's new magazine, The Liberator. Eastman argued in his address that the law had less to do with espionage and much more with the authority of censorship. Historians report that between the Espionage Act and its amendments, more than 1,000 convictions were carried out. Although the controversial Sedition Act amendments were repealed in 1921, many of the original provisions of the Espionage Act remain, codified under USC Title 18, Part 1, Chapter 37. The distribution of pamphlets such as Max Eastman's address was imperative to the growing social movements. They were cheap and easy to make, small and simple to share, physical qualities that made the books and the ideologies behind them so successful. The Little Blue Books were a popular series of small, staple-bound books published from 1919 to 1978 by the Haldeman Julius Publishing Company, located in Girard, Kansas. After purchasing a publishing house from his employer, Appeal to Reason, Emmanuel Haldeman Julius and his wife, Marcette, set out to publish small, low-priced paperback pocketbooks for both the working and educated classes. In addition to classic works of literature, their goal was to distribute pamphlets that included a wide range of ideas, from common-sense knowledge to various radical viewpoints of the time, including essays about abortion, homosexuality, and race. The small 3.5 by 5-inch pamphlet fit perfectly into a working man's back or shirt pocket, and could be shared among friends, family, and colleagues. With a starting subscription of 50 titles at 10 cents a book, Haldeman and Julius began printing at a rate of 24,000 copies a day. Over the years, the name of the pamphlets changed, at times known as the People's Pocket Series, the Appeal Pocket Series, and the 10 and 5 cent pocket series. And finally, in 1923, the Little Blue Book Series. Despite the book's popularity and Haldeman Julius being dubbed the Henry Ford of literature, the Little Blue Books came under government criticism after World War II, likely due to their inclusion of subjects such as socialism and atheism. After an FBI investigation and tax evasion conviction, the popularity of the books declined rapidly, finally coming to an end after the printing plant and warehouse was destroyed by fire in 1978. But there was sometimes a disconnect between writers and publishers and the demographic of their readers. Oftentimes, the pedantic and academic language found in literary journals such as The Masses and The Liberator missed the mark of the true working class experience. The evolution of a worker writer and a worker reader was necessary. Jack Conroy was born to Irish immigrants in a coal mining camp called Monkey Nest outside of Moberly, Missouri. Conroy joined up with a group of proletarian writers loosely connected with the industrial workers of the world, and within two years, his writing and enthusiasm landed him an editorial position with the journal, The Rebel Poet. However, Conroy believed that the notions of social injustice within Rebel Poet were too ill-defined to attract the ordinary reader. Conroy understood that the proletariat were more sensitive to the enticements of mass culture and consumerism than slogans such as Workers Unite. He understood that the abstract analyses of Marx's theory in Rebel Poet likely deterred rather than engaged new readership. He wanted a publication molded from the experience of young writers from the mills, mines, forests, factories, and offices of America, a publication that portrayed an honest rather than simplistic view of the working class experience. Most of all, Conroy wanted to provide a new outlet for worker readers so he could wean them away from romance novels and from escapist fiction that had nothing in common with their lives. With all this in mind, The Anvil was born in 1933. The title Anvil evoked the worker's world, strength, firmness, raw material, the force of physical labor, the shaping of a new world. These images also complemented the magazine's slogan, we prefer crude vigor to polished banality. The success of Anvil and other proletariat literary journals was typically short-lived. Ideological disputes within the movements, lack of funding, and government intervention made it difficult to keep any radical journal running for more than a couple of years. But the difficulties of running an underground press are all the more challenging when you are trying to do it from a conscientious objector's camp. 
The legislation of the Selective Service Act, or the draft as it's commonly called, was first enacted in 1917. Exemptions for those who objected to fighting in the war, or those who objected to war altogether, were allowed for any well-recognized religious sect or organization whose existing creed or principles forbid its members to participate in war in any form. These objectors were presented with roles to help progress the war effort, but which were declared by the president to be non-combatant. The draft extended into World War II, with non-combatant work transforming into 150 civilian public service camps across the country. In these camps, conscientious objectors performed work of national importance for the duration of the war, ranging from agriculture to industry and forestry work, all of which was done without pay. The majority of the CPS camps were run under the administration of religious organizations, and most of the COs were there because of their faith and beliefs. The history of the untied press thus began in Walport, Oregon on October 24, 1942, when the Civilian Public Service Camp No. 56, or Camp Angel, officially opened. Between 1941 and 1946, the Untied Press published nine books of poetry from four separate authors, and in that group of conscientious objectors was William Everson. The existence of the CEOs and their publications re-emerges with these books, a material memory which allows us to recall the history not only of the Untied Press, but also of conscription in the United States during World War II, along with the influence of anti-war poetry on 20th century American literature. The rareness of these books was thus determined by their printers, the conscientious objectors held in special labor camps for the duration of the war to do work of national importance in lieu of being sent overseas. Not only were these books printed in limited editions, but they were printed under the most exceptional circumstances. From the author's prefatory note. This series of poems is an attempt to render whole the emotional implications of a kind of life that has become almost universal. The life of the camp, the life of enforced confinement, individual repression, sexual segregation. Everywhere in the world these centers exist. Huge and permanent cities housing millions of men. Conscription camps, concentration camps, prison camps, internment camps, labor camps. Their effect upon the human spirit is not to be measured within the framework of a generation. The scars will remain for decades. The Independent Citizens Committee of the Arts, Sciences, and Professions, or ICC ASP, was an American association which lobbied unofficially for socialist policies such as President Roosevelt's New Deal. In 1947, during the early years of the Cold War, the ICC ASP came under attack by the House Un-American Activities Committee. This committee was established to investigate alleged disloyalty and subversive activities on the part of private citizens, public employees, and organizations suspected of having fascist or communist ties. The ICC ASP's chapter in Hollywood was hit the hardest due to the high number of members associated with the entertainment industry. In September 1947, the House on american Activities Committee subpoenaed 79 individuals, claiming that they were subversive and had injected communist propaganda into their films. The committee demanded they admit their political beliefs and name other communists in the industry, but in the end, only 10 Hollywood writers and directors appeared before the committee although they did so with open indignation and negativity. The Hollywood Ten, as they were called, relied on the First Amendment and argued that belonging to the Communist Party did not constitute a crime. For resisting authority and refusing to answer questions, they were cited for contempt of Congress. The citation included a criminal charge, which led to a highly publicized trial and prompted a group of studio executives to fire the Ten individuals. Following the congressional hearings was a Hollywood blacklist, which denied employment to anyone in the entertainment industry who were believed to be communist or communist sympathizers. These included not only actors, but also screenwriters, directors, and musicians. Following the congressional investigation of both left-wing and right-wing extremist political groups in the mid-1930s, support grew for a statutory prohibition of their activities. 
On June 28, 1940, Congress passed the Alien Registration Act, known as the Smith Act after its principal author, Democrat Representative Howard Smith of Virginia. The Smith Act criminalized any intent to cause the overthrow or destruction of any such government. Prints, publishes, edits, issues, circulates, sells, distributes, or publicly displays any written or printed matter advocating, advising, or teaching the duty, necessity, desirability, or propriety of overthrowing or destroying any government in the United States by force or violence, or attempts to do so, or organizes or helps attempt to organize any society, group, or assembly of persons who teach, advocate, or encourage the overthrow or destruction of any such government by force or violence, or becomes or is a member of or affiliates with any such society, group, or assembly of persons knowing the purposes thereof. The Smith Act trials of the Communist Party began in 1949 with 12 communist leaders. Prosecutors used pamphlets and books distributed by the Communist Party USA and interpreted their goals and policies, stating that the texts were examples of their political foundation and were evidence that the party did in fact advocate the violent overthrow of the government. The defendants argued against the charges, stating that the CPUSA advocated a peaceful transition to socialism. In addition, they believed that under the First Amendment they were guaranteed freedom of speech and association, protecting their membership in a political party, whichever that might be. After a 10-month trial, the jury found all 12 defendants guilty, while all five defense attorneys imprisoned for contempt of court, two of which were subsequently disbarred. During the Smith Act trials of the Communist Party USA, New Century publishers printed dozens of political pamphlets hoping to promote the defense of the 12 communist leaders who were arrested. New Century's pamphlets encouraged readers to help with its efforts to provide a legal defense team and to give publicity to that defense, whether through literature, radio programs, leaflets, and mass meetings. Published and distributed before the set trial date of October 15, 1947, the 12 and U was particularly important as the trial would begin just two weeks and three days before the presidential election. In the pamphlet, Elizabeth Gurley Flynn asks the reader, can ideas be put in jail? People can, but the whole society of the human race has proved it is impossible to imprison ideas. The crucifixion of Jesus and the violent deaths of all apostles who preached his works, the torture of Galileo, the exiling of Roger Williams and Anne Hutchison did not succeed in killing their ideas. Elizabeth Gurley Flynn was a veteran leader of the American labor movement, a prominent activist among the industrial workers of the world, and a member of the National Board of the Communist Party USA. In an effort to persuade public opinion of the Communist Party in the United States during the Smith Act trials, Elizabeth Gurley Flynn and New Century Publishers distributed dozens of pamphlets which promoted the party's socialist policies and highlighted the prominent members who were being persecuted. Many of Flynn's writings, including those published in her column in The Daily Worker, were used by the United States government as exhibits in the trials. In response, Flynn neither denied her association with the party nor attempted to invite others to join it. Instead, she advocated for the party with the belief that it was in the best interest of the people. In June 1951, however, a second wave of arrests were made in which Flynn herself was indicted. After a nine-month trial, she was found guilty and sentenced to a three-year term. Her stool pigeon testimony was used to deny her constitutional rights, and on April 24, 1952, Flynn addressed the court, acting as her own attorney. Her speech was published as a pamphlet by New Century Publishers the same year and distributed widely. Flynn served her sentence from January 1955 to May 1957 at the Alderson Federal Penitentiary in West Virginia. A decade after the Smith Act went into law, Congress enacted the Internal Security Act of 1950, also known as the McCarran Act after its principal sponsor, Democrat Senator Pat McCarran of Nevada. Despite being vetoed by President Truman, the legislation went through. In his veto message, Truman criticized the specific provisions as the greatest danger to freedom of speech, press, and assembly since the Alien and Sedition Laws of 1798, emphasizing that it was a mockery of the Bill of Rights and a long step toward totalitarianism. 
The McCarran Act required organizations associated with the Communist Party to register with the United States Attorney General, as well as provide a list of all of its members and reveal the organization's financial records. Once registered, members were liable for prosecution solely based on membership under continuation of the Smith Act due to the alleged intent of the organization. The McCarran Act also contained an emergency detention statute, giving the president authority to apprehend and detain any person on the grounds that they will probably engage in or probably will conspire with others to engage in acts of espionage or sabotage. Furthermore, the McCarran Act increased hostility toward immigrants by tightening exclusion and deportation laws. Immigrants who were members of the communist groups could not become citizens and in some cases were prevented from entering or leaving the country. If any immigrant was found in violation of the act within a five-year period of being naturalized, citizenship could be revoked. This had severe implications for thousands of immigrants displaced by World War II, and within a year of the legislation having been passed, the McCarran Act had excluded 54,000 people of German origin and 12,000 Russians. Under the McCarran Act, the question of the right to travel arose when the State Department ordered the singer Paul Robeson to surrender his passport. At the time, Robeson was scheduled to give a European concert. For associating with the Communist Party, however, Robeson was blacklisted and thereby denied his financial livelihood, despite no allegations of any illegal acts on his part. The story gained national attention, with opinions coming from both sides of the political spectrum. The American Civil Liberties Union also became involved and voted not to support Robeson on the grounds that the First Amendment did not guarantee an unrestricted right to travel. Like the early industrial workers of the world, the emerging counterculture of the mid-20th century relied on music to unite behind a cause. Erwin Silber was the longtime editor of Sing Out, a quarterly journal of folk music that was published from 1950 through 2014. In association with Sing Out, Silber also created the publishing company Oak Publications, which was responsible for the large portion of folk music material available in print. Lift Every Voice is the second people's songbook. The song from which the journal takes its title was first written as a poem by James Weldon Johnson in 1900 and set to music by his brother five years later. In addition to being a prominent writer of the Harlem Renaissance, Johnson was also a diplomat under President Theodore Roosevelt, who was the first black American to be hired at New York University, and he was a leader of the NAACP. As part of a tribute to Abraham Lincoln's birthday, Lift Every Voice and Sing was publicly performed as a poem by 500 school children. With it, they introduced Booker T. Washington, who was visiting the school at the time. By 1919, the NAACP adopted Johnson's songs as its official Negro national anthem for its powerful imagery of liberation and affirmation. While the first part of the 20th century was heavily focused on the working class and labor rights, the 1950s and 1960s added other issues to the radical agenda, inspiring the creation of new social movements pertaining to things such as civil rights, women's rights, and LGBT rights, along with environmentalism and protest against the Vietnam War. Young people played the most important role in the movements for social change, specifically because of their strength in numbers. After World War II, more than 76 million babies were born, creating what was called the baby boom. Furthermore, this generation spent more years in school, was more affluent, and had the existential freedom to question the moral and spiritual health of the country. Young students all across America became radical and rallied behind a number of different causes, expressing their concerns through marches, rallies, sit-ins, protests, and publications. The Street Wall Journal was a student protest paper issued by the Committee to Defend the Panther 21 during the student strikes of 1970. The protest began with the infamous Kent State protest, during which a student was killed by a National Guardsman, and were a response to the United States invasion of Cambodia, along with its general aggression in Southeast Asia. 
These three issues published give an overview of related activities taking place in New York at Columbia University, the New School, the City University of New York, and others, as well as rallies held throughout the city. Issue 1 begins, At hundreds of universities, thousands of students are on strike. We have decided that we cannot continue our business as usual as long as our government continues to wage a criminal war against the peoples of Indochina and continues to repress political dissidents at home. The papers call for strikes to expose the complicity of religious and educational institutions within the U.S. war industry. They also refer directly to the case of 21 Black Panther members jailed and accused of conspiring to bomb public buildings and call for their release, along with other dissidents against the Nixon regime. Although women had received the right to vote in 1920, their voice in national politics and economic life remained shuttered within the home. By the 1960s, the contemporary women's movement began to refocus their attention to work for change. Many credit Betty Friedan's book, The Feminine Mystique, published in 1963, for sparking second-wave feminism in the United States. Big Mama Rag, Incorporated was a radical feminist collective which began in the early 1970s. It was established to promote women's rights issues and devoted itself to providing lectures, seminars, a free library, and other educational activities provided to schools, clubs, and conferences. Its main focus, however, was the publication of its monthly newspaper, Big Mama Rag, the publication contained news items of interest to women's rights advocates and articles on hot topics such as abortion, ERA, alimony, rape, lesbianism, child custody, court cases, and contemporary legislation affecting women. It also contained interviews, editorials, poetry, and a feminist information service exchange. Advertising focused solely on feminist products and services and only constituted 20% of the newspaper's content. In 1974, Big Mama Rag Incorporated applied for nonprofit status with the IRS and included supporting documents that claimed it was both a charitable and educational organization. Charitable on the grounds that it promoted equal rights for women, and educational because it educated the public on the subject of women's issues. In addition, Big Mama Rag distributed two thirds of its newspaper free of charge. The IRS initially refused the exempt status for, among other reasons, the articles, lectures, editorials, etc. promoting lesbianism. Big Mama Rag appealed the district court's decision and in 1980, the U.S. Court of Appeals ruled in favor of the organization, writing that, applications for tax exemption must be evaluated on the basis of criteria capable of neutral application. The standards may not be so imprecise that they afford latitude to individual IRS officials to pass judgment on the content and quality of an applicant's views and goals, and therefore, to discriminate against those engaged in protected First Amendment activities. An earlier big mama was Mary G. Harris Jones, better known as Mother Jones, an Irish-born American school teacher, dressmaker, and more famously, union organizer and activist. After losing her husband and four children to yellow fever in 1867, and later her dress shop in the Great Chicago Fire of 1871, Mother Jones focused her energy in the fight for labor rights. Specifically, Jones organized on behalf of the United Mine Workers Union. She assumed the persona of Mother Jones after gaining prominence in the Appalachian coal region and helping the male workers, which she called her boys. A charismatic and effective speaker, Mother Jones was once called the most dangerous woman in America by West Virginia District Attorney Reese Blizzard. In addition to her participating in the minor strikes, Mother Jones also advocated for young women and children working in the silk mills. According to the 1900 census, one-sixth of American children under the age of 16 were employed, many of them suffering work-related disabilities. In 1903, to protest the lax enforcement of child labor laws, she organized a children's march from Philadelphia to the home of President Theodore Roosevelt in New York. Decades after her death, Mother Jones continued to be celebrated by a multitude of radical left-leaning organizations. The Appalachian Movement Press 
was one such establishment who glorified Mother Jones and others in print. AMP was started by a group of activists from the Huntington, West Virginia chapter of the Students for a Democratic Society with the goal of creating an activist grassroots press that would uplift and solidify a burgeoning Appalachian identity movement. The alternative publishing operation would contextualize Appalachian history through the eyes of Appalachian citizens within the entire state of West Virginia and regions of Eastern Tennessee, Western North Carolina, Eastern Kentucky, and Eastern Ohio. Throughout the 1970s, they printed material related to actions against strip mining and union corruption, as well as raising awareness for the recognition and treatment of black lung disease. In addition to creating and distributing their own publications, AMP also served the region for the go-to print shop for like-minded organizations. Throughout the 20th century, alternative publishing could be found all over the country, including in our very own Salt Lake City backyard. The Electric News was an alternative press started by Steve Jones in the early winter of 1968. Jones, a New York native, was inspired by radical left-wing newspapers evolving in the bigger cities, such as the LA Free Press, the Berkeley Barb, East Village Other, and the San Francisco Oracle. For Jones, it was important that the growing counterculture movement have its own voice in Salt Lake City. The Electric News was a full-size color tabloid which featured a mix of anti-war op-eds, poetry, music, local news, and interest into the metaphysical. The magazine was entirely funded by Jones's business venture, The Cosmic Airplane, a shop which sold edgy books, comics, and posters, in addition to an enterprise dedicated to jewelry, records, and drug paraphernalia. Unfortunately, Jones's plan to publish monthly was deterred by financial problems after the shop moved to an uninviting Westside neighborhood. Although Cosmic Airplane continued to be a successful business until 1991, the Electric News was cut short, with its sixth and last issue published in December 1969. Of the many stories featured in the magazine, interviews with Allen Ginsberg and Frank Zappa are considered to be, by Jones, particular highlights. If you haven't had enough of radical books yet, head on over to our digital exhibitions page where you can visit the full exhibition with more books and more information about the radical voices of the 20th century. You can also browse other digital exhibitions, which have been compiled from physical exhibitions that were displayed in the Special Collections Gallery on the fourth floor. The curation of each exhibition is centered around a specific topic or theme. For example, this exhibition is all about banned books. It presents books, pamphlets, newspapers, and magazines that were banned, forbidden, censored, redacted, expurgated, published anonymously, and otherwise attempted to be kept from public consumption. From religious and political writings to science, philosophy, and poetry, these pieces of paper were deemed by some too dangerous to exist. Some of the books include first editions of Galileo's Dialogues, Hobbes' Leviathan, Swift's Travels, Twain's Adventures of Huckleberry Finn, Salinger's Catcher in the Rye, and others. Too hot to handle, hot off the press. In addition to digital exhibitions, you can also browse and subscribe to Open Book, the Marriott Library's official rare books blog. Open Book is a great way to explore the breadth and depth of the rare books collection. About once a week, we feature a book or books from the collection with a little bit of information. The choices might seem random, but there is a method to the madness. We promise. By exploring open book, you'll get to see the vast networks that connect languages, cultures, and periods of history. Plus, you'll be able to impress your friends, family, and even your professors with the tidbits of knowledge from each post. Now that's pretty radical, isn't it? To subscribe to the blog, enter your email and hit subscribe. To search our archives, click on View All Rare Books Posts. Lastly, if you liked this virtual lecture, there are other virtual lectures you can view that touch upon a variety of different subjects. Here you can find even more radical resources for reference and research. Here you can learn 
what a book is exactly, and what makes a book rare. Look into the vault and learn about our collections, and gain insight to the vast networks of the book's history. Discover the relationship between books and social media, and explore how early manuscripts influenced the design of the book for years to come. Drop into the literature of oceanic exploration, then dive deeper into politics, science, literature, and our understanding of the universe. Take a look at writings by and about the indigenous peoples of Mexico, study early books in Nahuatl, and celebrate the Spanish language with an introduction to Chicanx artist books. And just when you think you've had enough, learn how to transform your creative writing to make your very own artist book. Books are important to our understanding of history, and to ensure that our history reflects all kinds of voices, we will continue to collect books and continue to tell their stories. Most importantly, we will continue to argue that there is nothing like holding the real thing in your hands. If you have any questions about the books in this presentation, or about any of the books in our collection, feel free to send us an email or visit our website at lib.utah.edu forward slash collections forward slash rare books.